Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, what outcomes matter most for looked after children and how can we make a difference? And I'm in conversation with Krista Parsons. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Krista Parsons. Um, my current role is um, I'm the uh, project lead for Caring to Learn at Lincolnshire County Council. Um, but I, I've been a teacher for 30 years and I still class myself as a teacher even though I've um, been working in a different role away from schools for the last three years. But prior to that I was head teacher in three schools um, and um, I've worked around the country and uh, worked in London for 15 years um, and then I've worked in very tiny rural village schools as well so I've had quite a varied uh, career uh, all in primary education um, you can probably tell from my accent I'm not I wasn't born in London I was born in Bolton in the northwest um, but uh, sort of have lived in different places I currently live in in Nottingham and uh, it was sort of a happy accident really found myself working in Lincolnshire which is a really interesting county a massive um, geographical spread uh, and also really widespread uh, a uh, range of schools really from the coast, rural, some sort of urban areas as well. So it is really very diverse um, in the types of schools uh, and children and families that we work with really. So tell me a little bit before we go into the question, tell me a little bit about the Caring to Learn um, project. What is that? What does it do? Yes, yeah, well it was actually I, I feel I, when I got this job I just felt like this is amazing actually this opportunity because um Lincolnshire is a, um, a great local authority actually and um because of that they work as what's called a partners in practice with the department for education and it's about developing innovative practice really and they do get the opportunity to uh, research and try new things and uh, and caring to learn is uh, one of these innovation projects um as part of partners in practice really um, and it was um, came about, I think, really uh, with a collaboration between uh, Kieran Barnes, who's the virtual school head in Lincolnshire, and um, uh, and John Harris, who is the head of regulated services. And so, sort of a link between, you know, social care and education, really, um, uh, to to kind of answer this question: How can we improve outcomes for our looked after and previously looked after children? Um, and we were lucky to you know receive the funding from the DfE to sort of launch this research and uh, and this sort of way to trial new and perhaps different approaches really because practice uh, you know in general across the counties is very good and um, we've got some great schools and um, you know a, a good and outstanding um, children's services but it really is how to make the difference really what extra can be added to um, you know, improve life chances. And we've got key performance indicators of, you know, reducing exclusion, improving attendance, improving educational outcomes. And those are key factors, obviously, but um, it's about, you know, how do we improve the lives really of um, our children in care um, and, and, and children who were previously in care. So we, um, I sort of was really fortunate, I think, to land this role of, as what is project lead, project manager, um, coming from uh, very keen to have an education back, someone with an education background leading sort of the development. Um, and then I've got a, a, a tiny team, really, myself and one other, we focus full time on this, Rebecca Fleming, who's a, a practice supervisor in our early help team with sort of many years of experience uh, working, you know, more on that sort of early help and social care side, really. So sort of joined together that approach that joined up approach to really see what we could do differently or uh, try new things really to to help uh, support everyone who works with our uh, children in care. You've already alluded to the idea there that when we think about outcomes for children quite often we're thinking about educational outcomes in their narrowest sense but actually mm. um, caring to learn and the work that you do looks so much broader than that so how do you decide where to focus your efforts as you say you're a tiny team serving a huge area yes. what matters yeah. most well we we were really lucky to work in the development stages with um, uh, UCL um, 
um, Professor Claire Cameron and, and sort of focus on um, social pedagogy approach really. Um, and, and if people aren't uh, aware of social pedagogy, it's really about a holistic approach to education, you know, uh, education in its widest sense really. Mm -hmm. So bringing in, you know, um, looking at things holistically, you need to, you know, you need to think about who, who are the people that can affect this. And, uh, and we came up with this idea um, um, that we snappily titled the triad of success, which is really about home, um, school, in, again, in its widest sense, home setting in its widest sense, and services, agencies, everybody else external to those, how those three groups work together equally um, and, um, you know, are on the same page and, and they communicate effectively and they understand each other's point of view and, and things like that. And we, one of the things we, we, I think you see it everywhere, really, is that everybody, you know, social workers, schools, um, carers, they were all, you know, doing the best and, and working really hard and, and really got their heart and their soul into, um, you know, doing the best for children. But they're often working in parallel like this rather than, you know, really be understanding each other's roles and, and sort of communicating fully and, and working equitably, really. And that was one of the things as well. We kind of, uh, in lots of research, it's highlighted that really interestingly you know foster carers will say they they feel like a lesser partner you know in in that term that perhaps they you know they do their job of, of looking after the children and providing a home but um sometimes they feel that you know their voice isn't heard as strongly as other professionals and they often uh, say this that you know because other people call professionals that it seems that their opinion matters more or their voice is heard more uh, and that was a really interesting uh, uh, thing to hear, actually. And, and so we've tried to avoid using the word professionals to talk about other people because, um, you know, one of the things we have found out is our carers are amazing and they are the experts in, in the, you know, in these children. They live with them at all, all <laughs> 24 hours a day. And um, so to really kind of raise their profile and, and um and, and hear their voice and give them, you know, make them feel that they are an equal partner in that sort of uh, triangle, really. And, um, but also, I think coming from schools, I had an interesting perspective that I felt schools were quite low in this pile, really, because one of the things that obviously is key is safeguarding, safeguarding and, and making our children safe. And, and uh, that's where this process starts, really. And, um, and so, you know, safeguarding is, is, is the the goal to start off with isn't it but often it does remain the kind of key focus really um that we've got children in a safe place we've removed the you know risk and we're we're, we're sort of putting them in, in um in a safe and stable place um and that's kind of sometimes where the conversation then stops rather than um right we we've we've helped them survive now but how can we help them go on and thrive um, and so, yeah, moving that conversation on, moving our aspirations further and higher is really what we're focused on as well. So that was kind of where we started. So we did things differently in that, for instance, we have a whole training program which we um, uh, uh, have available for schools, children's services and, and, um, and carers. But instead of having sessions for teachers, sessions for social workers, sessions for foster carers, we have everybody together. Um, I mean, currently it's all virtual, but um, prior to this, everybody's in the room, hearing each other's stories, listening to each other's points of view, sometimes raising an eyebrow, you know, perhaps saying, oh, you know, that's not my opinion, you know, and, and, and sort of bringing that, you know, that little bit of um, a challenge in the room, and, and, and I'm being able to work through that sometimes in discussions, and and, and and certainly making links and building networks and um, and building understanding of others' perspectives and points of view and challenges, barriers and successes. So I think bringing everybody together in that way has been one of the key things we have found has been very very successful um, in what we've tried to do for the last three years. Really, so we're really you know we really say now that's what it's got to be. It's got to be everyone together in this um, and physically together. Or, virtually together um so that they can they can share and understand each other better really so that's one of the things we did we also uh it, it was kind of three-pronged attack so we we have this kind of uh 
development programme. We have a good practice framework, which we built. Um, and we, uh, again, this is based very much on, on Claire Cameron's work, uh, book, which is called Caring Schools and Learning Placements. And um, so we developed what are called the Caring Schools and Learning Homes Frameworks. And they're self-evaluation tools, really. Uh, you know what good practice is in this area and um and and for schools we built it into an award because um it's something to work for in a developmental process so we have a sort of bronze silver gold three-tier developmental process of working through this but it gives them a chance to look at their provision and practice for you know all of that, that it's not just about looked after children actually it's wider than that isn't it it's, you know it's all that huge group of disadvantaged children and families i suppose that um because what's good practice for looked after children is certainly good practice for all children, really. So we, we really make that point. And we work with all schools. They don't have to have looked after children currently with them. Um, because, of course, they could, you know, have looked after children at any point, really. So we, what we like to say that they're looked after ready. Um, uh, but we do really stress that what's good practice for these children is good practice for all their children. We built... Um, uh, interrupt me at any point. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm loving every, every time I, I have a question or a thought, you seem to just naturally go there. So I'm just taking it all on board. Okay, lovely. Um, we built uh, our sort of development and, and our principles on what on the cornerstone, what we've called the cornerstones of good practice. And so it's it's kind of within Lincolnshire, we work within signs of safety as our safeguarding structure. Um, so and and that's strength based practice you know it, it sort of asks us to sort of see where the resources are in the network and, and and work from that and build on safety um so we kind of take that strength-based approach and then we've built in uh, you know to say well within that we're working in a social pedagogical way so we're looking at a uh, uh, the lifespan and the whole uh, holistic approach to education in its widest sense uh, we've built firmly on principles of restorative practice, relationship-based practice. The relationship comes first. It's where everything stems from. And that also, you know, we're, very early on, we hooked massively into um, the Rita Pearson TED Talk, Every Child Deserves a Champion. And um, and that room, you know, some of the things she talks about in that amazing TED Talk ring true for everything we were trying to achieve. It's about, you know, even just one trusting adult, one strong relationship can make the difference for a child's life. So we really, you know, that idea of relationships, but also relationships between uh, adults and adults, adults and children, and children and children as well. And so, you know, how to make relationships better, stronger, and more effective in all areas, in your in your work, in school, uh, in um, in your meetings. And in your families as well so that's what uh, relationship based practice and then uh, introducing this um and, and being really trauma aware being uh, looking at things through a trauma lens understanding what's happening for children or what has happened for children have a better understanding of the, all that sort of uh, area um and being really sort of trauma aware in how we work with our children um and their families and um, and each other as well, really. So that's kind of what we build on there. Wow, there's a lot to unpick there. So um, I'm going to start with some of the things you said most recently first, and I'm I'm interested in learning a little bit more in terms of the relationships based practice, which speaks to what so many of us think we know, but putting it into practice when you have a child maybe arriving in your home, in your school, who you don't know, who has faced a challenging time, building those relationships is difficult sometimes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So what have you learned along the way and what are the kind of the, the practical things that you advise and guide and have seen work that can help people mm -hmm. with that? Well, it, social pedagogy has this model called the three Ps, um, which talks about what is your, um, your professional, your personal and your private selves um and you know that really rung true when we looked at that we talked about this uh to a lot of uh professionals i suppose but you know but a lot of uh, the 
people we come in contact with because when you need when you want to build a relationship with someone you have to make a bond you have to share something of yourself so um people who are overly hidden behind their professional role that's that sometimes is a barrier to making strong relationships and uh, and i think um so it was really it's really interesting that we we do we ask people to kind of share a bit of their professional their personal selves as well and, and understand so so even from silly things like every time we meet you know we share a, we have a check-in and we share a little you know we ask these kind of icebreaker questions but with a purpose actually with an intent of saying you know let's you know we, we're here for a, a serious reason we're here you know we're here to um to do some really good work but actually let's have a smile let's have a share share ourselves and let's make um a link and a connection with each other as well so you know we often ask people what makes you smile before we start something or what um you know what was the last thing you really had a huge laugh about or or you know what's a what was um what's something you're looking forward to what was your favorite uh, toy growing up anything like that to kind of kind of bring that into the arena and, and say that well, actually um the connection is important we'll start building that first and then we can get on to the business as it were and and that principle is really important with children isn't it and again we've we've borrowed and, and learned about and and we try and bring from lots of different models so in the in the sort of trauma-informed arena we um talk about um uh, Dr. Bruce Perry, the three R's, which is, you know, um, uh, regulate, relate, reason. So again, it's about being in that really calm state, but then the relationship comes next. Um, and then we can get to the business part, as it were, but not until the other two parts are in place. So we 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 talk a lot about that, especially with foster carers, as you say, our, our school staff who who are working day in day out with um you know children and young people they might be angry they might be distressed you know we've tried to ban the word challenging behavior um the challenge is for us really isn't it the challenge is for us and i think um you know so we, we say to people think about you know, uh, meltdowns and incidents all these ways we describe these kinds of things so in schools or in homes um as a real sign of distress in some way a, a behavior a communication of behavior and and then take that step back we also um uh use ideas from therapeutic parenting from uh, uh dan hughes pace um and and that idea of you know playfulness in relationships comes in it's really interesting all these you know when we're trying to bring some ideas together but lots of them are overlap flow together really well actually because again pace talks about playfulness joyfulness um acceptance of people as they are um accepting of situations and then curiosity wanting to know more wanting to understand better and empathy and and um and, uh, so we say that for for everybody you know if you you know, if in this, when I think of a time I was in a school and I was really frustrated with a social worker because I wasn't getting the action I wanted or I didn't think they'd heard me or they did, they weren't taking my point of view, you know. And then now when I think about that, if I think about, and I know more about social work and how, you know, and the structures, barriers, processes and all those kinds of things, I think, oh gosh, I didn't understand half of what how that person had to work and and what they were dealing with as well. And now I do know that and I think, oh, because I've, I've learned more and, I've, and I have that empathy, you know, and I have that understanding. Uh, the same with carers. Um, I think as I had coming to work on this, you know, working in education for so long and, I, you know, I think I was quite, you know, I wasn't too bad at it. But, um, but coming to work on this project for the last three years has really taught me so much. And I just think, oh, I, I don't, you know, if I am, do go back into school, I shall have, have understand and, and work um in much better ways now from benefiting this and, and i thought well if i've learned that then i i hope what we could, we're doing in in the work we're doing with people is helping them now currently you know in the roles that they're doing really oh you're muted That's that's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, get me podcast host <laughs> muted. I was making a great point there too. Right, so what was I going to say? I was going to say um, 
obviously there's that feeling there and I think we always have this at every point in our life obviously we're learning all the time and if we could go back in time and talk to our younger selves and we would have advice um our younger selves wouldn't necessarily listen to that advice very readily but I wonder if during these past three years is there anything you've learned that you think your past self would find so outrageously unlikely or surprising that they probably wouldn't listen what's really surprised you I, I don't know if it surprised me, but it's a lesson I should have learned a lot earlier, I think. And that is to really value parents and carers and their path. I, I think, I don't think this is just a trait of teachers, but we often think we are the font of knowledge. We are the people imparting that. We are the people who have the answers. Uh, and often parents come to us and talk to, you know, and, and, and ask us to help and, and for support about stuff in the home and that kind of thing. Um, but actually what I've learned from foster carers, from working with our foster carers, is that they are so um, full of insight and, uh, and their knowledge and, and, um, and they don't often think they are. You know, sometimes they think, oh, you're the person, you know, in this professional role. Um, but actually what I've seen as, as well, what we've demonstrated, and um, I'd like to talk about that in a minute, so as in some of our studies is that um, what has made the difference for academic progress has been the input of the carers and how that's um, been different. And so I, you know, I often, uh, I, I, I can hold my hands up and I, I think anybody in schools would probably if they were being really honest say you know at times in my school career I've thought oh no I'm sure I know best and um and actually no I don't think that <laughs> you know and I think I think I've got something to bring but I actually think oh, I've got to listen to other people more and and I don't have to have all the answers and I think that's something um that people if they if they catch on to that quicker <laughs> they they work better as a team really don't they I think that that's a classic example, isn't it, of how you need to know a lot to realise that there's more that you need to know. <laughs> yeah. And I think, yeah, that's and again, it goes back to, as you're saying, sort of Dan Hughes and, and Pace, really, that curiosity and empathy always uh, in, in your role. So so talk to us about the work that you did around how um, sort of academic uh, performance was impacted on by what was happening in, in the home. Well, we, I mean, as well as looking at all these kind of relationship based things and, um, you know, and behavior and, and, and all those kinds of aspects, we, we obviously we wanted to look at how can we make a difference in, in academic terms um, and progress and obviously a big area um, where there's a huge gap, as it were, where we want to narrow the gap is, is in the area of um, literacy, reading, English, we found that's, you know, a trend through a lot of our children in care and through the work of the virtual school. So we, um, again, we worked um, as part with UCL who've run some great programs actually. Um, one of the things they run is a PALAP program, which is um, promoting achievement of looked after children. And, and we worked with them and we um, worked with the amazing lady, Catherine Carroll, uh, and she, um, as part of that and she um we launched this uh program we've called it caring to read now which is about how to a literacy intervention study really um and in the first year we ran it we ran we worked with five schools 10 children from five schools all in primary uh, in key stage two uh, and the profile of the children we asked for were um children who were significantly behind in literacy or in reading the the sort of age expectation but who didn't have a sort of defined uh, special need or additional need so I suppose what we were trying to uh, um, identify were children who were underachieving and, and who weren't where they should be really um and um and then we uh, so Catherine we again we brought together school staff and the care and carers and we worked with our educational psychologists um, um and Catherine brought that group together and we started off with um uh, all of the children um had a full assessment led by education psychologist psychologist and that we tested them for their um phonics knowledge their word reading and their reading ages and then we um um and then and the psychologist put together a really in-depth report about that that individual child and then they worked closely 
um, with the, the, both the carer and the school staff together to really look at what that report was telling them. Um, and then each group had to devise then a 10 week intervention that would be led in school and in the home. But again, we wanted to make, because schools do literacy and reading interventions all the time and, and children make progress and have one-to-one -one, uh, support and attention. Um, but we kind of wanted to move it away from, oh, this is a, a, a separate intervention in school and we might send her some work home for the child to do a bit more or a worksheet or something else for them to practice. And obviously schools were already asking children to do and families do home reading. But again, we wanted to try and make it different. So what we said was that the carers and the schools had to plan closely together the, the action. So if the child did say two 20 minute sessions a week in school, um, they had to work with someone they already had an established relationship with. So it could be a teaching assistant or a support teacher, or if it was they had time and they could organize it, the class teacher. Um, and then they would do two 20 minute sessions at home um, that mirrored the, the things they were doing in school or, or built on, but um, they, again, it wasn't just a case of sending homework. They had to be planned jointly between the school and, and the carer. Um, and, the, and the intervention had to be focused on the needs of the child through addressing things that came up in the report, but they also had to address the interests of the child. So it was really important um, to build on what the child was interested in. And then it could also bring in some aspects of what they were currently doing in class, their curriculum. So the, the idea of pre-teaching, you know. So they had to, again, link up with what was coming up in the, in the child's work uh, or curriculum and what could they work on and support. There. So there's kind of three elements to it. So, for instance, one child was mad on judo, so everything was judo themed or football or the Arctic was one. <laughs> the child was, so everything was to do with that kind of thing. So, um, uh, so that's how they worked. And they did this intervention over 10 weeks. And then over a sort of four to five month, after a four to five month period, uh, and we checked in, we worked with them periodically. We, we obviously met at the start and then we um, met halfway to find out how things were going. We shared some good practice uh, about shared reading, all kinds of some tips and, and, um, and resources that people had come up with. But it was very much a bespoke intervention for that child based on relationships, on their need and their interests. And um, and, try, and, and trying to replicate that three-pronged attack that we uh, have, have defined. And, but and amazingly, when we, they were tested again uh, at the end, as, as, as I say, of, over about a five, four or five-month period, and some of the progress we saw was absolutely amazing. One child made five years progress in the five space years. Of five, five years progress in the space of five months. Now he was identified as being a bright and intelligent boy, but his reading was far behind. Um, and some children made, on average, the children in the study, uh, and it was very small. You know, we acknowledge that, but it but made uh, two years progress in a five month period. And and in all the interventions and work I've done in schools, I've never seen that much progress in a short time. Um, and out of those 10 children, uh, all children made some progress and half of them made huge progress and half of them made kind of general, the type of progress we would generally see after an intervention. And we again, so we look closely at what was the difference between the ones that made the huge progress and the ones that just made sort of OK progress. And it was really um, the, the knowledge, skills and involvement of the carers. So all the carers for the children who made the most progress, the sort of progress in years, were ones who'd engaged with, our, with Caring to Learn from the start, who'd been on lots of our workshops, training programmes and, uh, and uh, been involved in all, lots of our events and things like that. So kind of got where we were coming from. Um, they were the ones who were most engaged with the school. They had they had regular planning meetings. They attended all our meetings. They um, uh, they worked as an equal partner, as we say, in that planning process, and they delivered faithfully their sessions every week. Um, and the, the the children who only made the okay progress, they had uh, some you know engagement from the carers, and uh, but they tended it tended to be more school led, and the school would have to send home the ideas or would. 
can you try this? Would you do this? Rather than it sort of being that equal partnership. And so that came out really strongly, actually, that the involvement and the engagement and understanding of the carers really made a big difference. And so we tried, we did this, we ran this um, same study with um, uh, five new schools and 10 new children last year and it was all going swimmingly and we were look you know in our meetings and our uh, sort of um quality of findings so far where the children were making progress it was we, it was following exactly the same pat pattern unfortunately then the first lockdown hit and we couldn't carry out the final assessments so we didn't get the final data to to get the you know the the quantitative results to see exactly how much progress they've made that's uh, and that's a shame so but uh, everything pointed to it was following exactly the same pattern the carers most involved and the children and the, the ones who stuck faithfully to the interest of the child the needs of the child and working closely and e equitably with the carer were the ones that were making really really good progress again so you know that told us in many ways um that that is important what is how the care is viewed are they an equal partner in this sort of process um or are they kind of an additional peripheral kind of uh, a person um that how what, how they understand the process what's going on and um and uh, you know and by that what I, I don't mean you know they weren't um super academic uh, the carers or anything like that they you know they were just the ordinary ordinary people foster carers um, and one of our carers I know she won't mind me saying in particular said oh I'm terrible at reading my language English is rubbish and spelling I'm rubbish at that but again her um foster child made two years progress because she worked closely with that so so it um you know again we weren't sort of confirming that myth of or oh, you know highly educated or middle class uh parents you know the ones that get the results in in you know in this case just people who were committed to the process and worked closely um with each other were the ones that made the difference really um and we called the children the children were, were called junior researchers they they knew they were taking part in this uh study to help them improve their reading um but they also knew they were taking part in this study because we were researching how we can help lots of children and how we can tell other children what works and how they can improve their reading so they were called junior researchers and they were really enthusiastic to be part of it as always, they loved having one-to-one -one time. So they, you know, that was um, not an issue for them. They did love that. Um, what was an issue as always was, um, you know, the time these interventions happened, they didn't want to miss their favorite subjects or other school events that were going on. Um, and they, but they were, and they were really keen that uh, about the stuff that they did at home coming into school and teachers really wanting to know what they were doing there and, and were interested in that and how that translates into the classroom. Oh, and the other finding that came out of that is their class teachers reported a massive increase in confidence in class um, in other, you know, in other areas. So, um, for instance, one um, teacher reported that a child who had never, not, uh, in the time she'd had him in her class, he had never voluntarily put his hand up to and answered a question started to do that um and again that was the link from having the confidence some of the pre-teaching that was helping him oh i've already talked about this um you know earlier this week uh, in my study session um and so he started to do that so confidence in the class grew as well and so that, that was another really good uh, byproduct of, of um what we found in this study and I think you end up in a very rapid cycle of positive reinforcement when that happens, don't you? I know certainly, um, so I have two daughters, one biological, one um, adopted, and um, the adoptive daughter has struggled with maths particularly. Um, and that's been a real challenge. And she'd got to the point where even just knowing she was in a lesson that was called maths before anything was said or done, she went into that kind of fight, flight, freeze. Um, and she's had really, really brilliant input just recently, one-to-one -one with a really great um, support staff member. And the difference that we 
we've seen in her all throughout everything that she's doing and her confidence mm. at trying new things and speaking up. And it sounds, it doesn't sound silly. It won't sound silly to you, but to me, it was surprising, I suppose. Things like engaging in debate around the dinner table, which has nothing to do with maths, but I'm yeah. sure is related to she doesn't feel stupid anymore. Exactly. Yeah, that is exactly it. Because these, you know, small steps of success, we just build on them, don't we? Our feeling confident, our belief in ourselves. We have success in one area and then you start to believe, don't you? Oh, I, I, actually, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not as daft as I thought I was or, I, you know, I, I can do it. And yeah, we, we really see that, actually. So that, again, asking people to, you know, um, um, a solutions focused approach really interesting we we've looked at kids skills um which um is dr ben Furman, and it's not well known in this country actually but um it's grown out of a solutions focused um approach um he is a, a psychiatrist in finland and um uh, sort of developed this work over many years um but it's, it's again it's strength-based so it so often you know children are referred to him to with problems and be problem behavior and issues and things like that um but because of how solution focused stuff works you don't talk about the problem you you know it's problem free talk you talk about uh, what you want to learn or what your current skills are and you build on those so uh it's really interesting we and we uh, kids skills has developed this into a 16 step program that sounds challenging doesn't it but it's, it flows really well um, and uh, anyone listening out if you know if you work with children in any way you can use it in the home or school I would have, I would recommend you do a kids skills and have a look at it because it's about how you turn a problem into a skill to be learned and so rather than saying oh this child is aggressive we it, again it asks about what um it asks the adults to be curious and look beyond the presenting behaviours as to what it is. And then it asks you to work together on how you can turn that into um, a skill to be learned. So for instance, a child who was having lots of meltdowns and was really, you know, um, I want, I want, um, I, I, I want that toy. Well, just you have to wait a minute because someone else is playing with it. Ah, you know, a big meltdown kind of thing. Or um, can I have a biscuit now? Well, we're going to have our tea in five minutes so you can have a biscuit later ah, you know and those kinds of things but actually that was translated into this this uh, child is not very good at being patient and waiting so the skill that they need to learn is wait um and and um we've got a great example of a foster care who worked with a child a, a, a four-year-old on this um, so they again they did that step by step. Let's learn to wait for ten seconds. Let's wait, learn to. And she got sand timers and all kinds of things like that, and a big clock with a big ticking hand. And let's go. We're going to wait for. We're going to practice waiting in all kinds of scenarios, contexts. Let's just practice waiting now for ten seconds. Or, oh, shall we go and do that? Yes, but let's practice waiting before we do that. So not talking about the issue at all, or you you have big emotional outbursts, or uh you know you've no patience or any of that kind of thing you can't share you did a um let's just focus on learning this skill and and we say oh that's the skill we're practicing at the moment and the child talks about the skill they're practicing and shares it with others and um you know we bumped into this child at um, a foster care conference we were queuing up for the buffet and he with he was with the foster care and it was a long queue and he turned to uh, rebecca my colleague and said oh i'm practicing he said he was kind of oh i'm practicing waiting this is waiting for a long time isn't it and he also said oh I've, I, I, when I start start I've got to get good at waiting because when I start start school soon there's a lot of waiting that goes on there <laughs> you know and it was just, it's just a whole different way of thinking about something that uh moves away from the child being the problem the you know the the their behavior that nagging cycle how do we uh, you know work on that or how do we get them to stop doing that thing um, and then you move on to what are they going to learn? What are they going to develop? It's almost, you know, we talk about teaching reading, don't we? And we teach that in stages and steps and we kind of keep moving forward. But we don't really teach behaviour as such in the same way. And, and, and Kids Skills talks about that. But I'm going, I just remember what my original point was going to be. Um, because you build on skills, sometimes with older children in this process, you say, 
what's the skill you want to work on? You try and get, you know, give them control of thinking about that. And you might think, oh, it's I want you to stop hitting people every time they come near you. You know, but they might say, oh, I want to um, I want to get better at reading. <laughs> and you, right, but that's not you, you might be thinking that's not the skill I want you to work on. But, you, you know, you don't do that. You work at you think about. Um, and and to be fair, someone said, oh, I want to grow. I want to stop biting my nails, grow my fingernails. And again, you're thinking, oh, that's the least of the problems we want to work on, you know. But they uh, worked on that. And miraculously, because they get success and achieve in one area, just as you've described, they say, find um, that they uh, then improve in lots of other areas. And Dr. J Jeff James, who I know you've talked to uh, in one of your podcasts, and, you know, you know massive solution focused advocate, he tells about a young boy, uh, no, sorry, about a, uh, a boy in secondary school who was on a risk of being excluded. I don't know whether he spoke about this, but he worked with him about being a better rugby player. Um, you know, and, and the school staff were probably thinking, what's going on here? This boy's about to be public, uh, permanently excluded because he can't stop fighting, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But he worked with him on an eight week program about how to improve his rugby game. And, and he didn't, and again, he that massively improved his behaviour and the issues that the, they were seeing in school. He didn't he didn't get permanently excluded. He didn't he you know his, his amount of conflicts and physical altercations and things he got into dropped uh, dropped dramatically. And and so again, that, for me, that says that you know building success in one area, focusing on achievement in one area, um, and and showing children the belief that they can achieve can be have massive widespread impacts really I think it goes back to what you were saying before about relationships building as well though isn't it because I think when we hear a child and we allow them to set the agenda a bit then um it, it does build that that trust and that connection doesn't it Je yeah. the, the Jeff James podcast I'll, I'm trying to make a note of the things that you're mentioning so I can link out to them in the show notes but um the thing I remember um most vividly from that and I've, I've talked about a few times since was um a, a girl who he worked with when asked you know what did she consider herself to be good at and it was making mashed potato um and uh, and he oh sorry and uh, he talked about how um yeah he used that as a jumping off point um and it felt, felt like a very unlikely one but actually it was something that meant something to her mm. um I um, wanted to just um, come back on the reading intervention briefly because I think there will be people listening in thinking I need this program uh, for the child I'm caring for or in my school. Is there a program that people can uh, sign up to or will it be published or how does that uh, we, Yeah, we are. What we're really hoping to do, um, you know, depending on circumstances and uh, restrictions and all this kind of thing is, is, is again, uh, launch this study again to get sort of wider results and we do uh, want to publish it then because um, we've got a report that is published from the first study uh, as part um, and I think it's probably available on the UCL website the PALAC um, resources web page I think uh, that details this and the results that we're gaining that um, and, and Catherine Carroll has, is work, has worked on and, and we're hoping to pick this work up soon um a sort of a guidebook for this really yeah because it's a it's a it's almost and she talks about it as a no intervention intervention you know we love to get those off the shelf interventions to our <laughs> they all get a big folder and it's got session one session two and all that kind of thing in it but and i, th and I think this does have real imp in, uh, implications for tutoring and, and you know this whole national tutoring program uh which is sort of you know obviously you know children do need to catch up and we we do need to help and support them and, and often on a one-to-one -one basis but what is the way that works best really and and kind uh, and my feeling from working in this is that um not that tutors are you know are bad but going away and, and working with um uh tutors completely separate from the school or you know doing completely a different program of work or um that's not linked and doesn't make the links between them and what they're doing um you know, I, I don't know. It just it, it doesn't ring with what we found in our intervention uh, that it has to be about. Um, um, I, I suppose particularly for um, uh, the kinds of children we were working with, particularly uh, that it didn't. It you know it doesn't have those things in place about 
uh, does it work from their strengths or from, you know, from certainly from their specific needs? Does it work from their interests? And, and is it led by someone they've, they've got a trusting relationship with already so that they can kind of get straight into the focus of the work? You don't have to spend five weeks or six weeks or however long it takes building up a relationship with someone um, before you can actually get the, get down to the work and that you know that's hard as well so I think it, it has got some really good implications so you know, we'd love to you know we yeah that's one of the things we do want to do publish this further and work and, and, and create this kind of guidebook for you know what we think would be a really effective way to run an intervention like this but there's nothing and this we do list kind of things that have worked and the good ideas and, and resources that people have used over the, the past two interventions uh, but there's no kind of oh you must do this and this is the sequence you've got to follow because again we found that it needs to be personalized for the for the child for the individual um and and, and schools and carers and, and having that that additional input from someone like a specialist teacher or a uh ed psych it was also really key there as well um so yes currently as i say yeah we're we're a bit we're only halfway through that work really and we do want to sort of move that on and we're hoping, you know, to launch, who knows, from September, we'd really like to run this study again on a wider scale um, and, and have some more results that we can really show people. Um, but yeah, that first year PALAC um, uh, intervention is, is, part, is part of what UCL have already published. Okay, that's really helpful. Just I think, yeah, it sounds so good. I'm sure people will want to do it. But I think it sounds then it's it's as much as anything, a kind of an ethos and a, and a culture of uh, reading and sharing and that people can do that right away. But we can keep in touch and maybe we can support with a sharing some of those ideas. Um, and B, then, um, you know, if you do roll that study out further, we can help with with recruitment and things like that. Yeah, I love that. I had one uh, kind of final fairly gnarly question, which uh, I think you saw coming on Twitter, which was really, what is the role of the social worker mm. in all of this? Yeah, well, I, I think if that when I saw that, I thought that is a great question here because, but I think it goes back to that whole idea of corporate parenting. You know, that term corporate parenting is so horrible. Isn't I it? hate it. <laughs> I um, but what that actually means are, you know, but, um, what the person with parental responsibility is, is their role really and often that is the social worker isn't it you know they hold this that kind of specific um, thing of parental responsibility within this wider idea of, of for children in care um, obviously depending how they're in care as it were um, of corporate parenting but it really makes me think Basically, I think they should that the parenting part is the is the role there. Now they're not replacing families and parents, but uh, Lem Sisse talks about it brilliantly. Uh, you know, he talks about uh, if this social care system was was fully functioning, was amazing, was working so well for our, our children in care. Uh, we not well, no he he's made, he's being flippant and he's making a joke as as Lem Sisse does, but he says, um, you know, if we a measure of how we'd know it was really working well was that middle class parents would want to get their children in care because they were getting a better deal and they would be, you know, and that's a, a, that's his joke to say though is, it, you know, are we, are these children getting the, you know, the advantages, you know, we call them disadvantaged children, don't we? How are we ensuring that they are, um, you know, being uh, given the same advantages of, of, of other children with, with um, supportive families, uh, pushy parents, you know, all that kind of thing that uh, want, that constantly are kind of uh, pushing in the very nicest way. I don't want anyone to misinterpret what I'm saying here, but pushing their children to the front of the queue, as it were, or getting those advantages for their children and, um, and making sure they're not missing out on things and all that. And, and that is, for me, what you know, us in our corporate parenting role should be about, really. We are if that's not there in a child's life for whatever reason um you know i was not been there in the past and we're taking on that role then we need to be you know i always think you know we need you need to think like a, a you know a, a stereotypical pushy parent or, or whatever um again in the nicest possible way but you know we need to be there advocating for that child for their whole lives for their future for you know for now and for their future as well and i think I suppose in, in that question, going back to that question, I'm saying, 
it's not just about finding them a safe place to be and to live it's about everything isn't it and so we do say to social workers and we you know we want people in wider roles to to see that wide role to accept that parent, corporate parenting role um and in Lincolnshire one of the things we've done is you know stop talking about I, I mean I've said it a few times this morning and you have to train yourself don't you but rather than talking about looked after children we talk about our children so using this word our children um and we use it in a lot of our documentation or um, you know when we're talking to groups of people um are we talking about to foster carers or social workers or other you know children's services teams we say about our children because they're ours and um, we want for them the same that we would want for our own children as it were um and that's kind of i suppose i hope that answers that question really because yeah they've just got to think like that think wider than move on as i said move on from safeguarding move on from surviving to thriving think wider think about our children and what they need and what we would want for them um, and I, I love that phrase, our children. And I remember when I spoke at the Virtual Schools Network event in uh, Lincolnshire, that was one of the things that I think I ended up getting on my soapbox about because, um, uh, yeah, the, the differences in terms. Um, and it's it's difficult because looked after children or children looked after is a term that people understand. And in a slightly wider context, if we say our children, then we can't differentiate that particular group yes. that we're talking about. But actually, yeah. that's kind of the point here, isn't it? We want yeah. all of our children to just be our children. But sometimes we need to be able to give them that extra bit of support. But I love it. I love our children. Um, what? Um, what thought would you like to, to kind of close with? What's the thought that you would like to leave in people's minds as we wrap up? What's been a thank you for such a great conversation? Uh, yeah, I don't know. We, you you asked me, um, I went out to fill in my little thing about, you know, some books that I, are really influential for me. And I wave this book. I love this book. This is my, the book of my life, as it were. Not my life, because I've lived this life. But, T tell the um, listeners what book it is. because so um, I'm waving it about. Yeah, <laughs> this is a book. It's a great book. <laughs> Classic. Um, a Kestrel for a Knave, Barry Hines, or if you've seen the film Kez, you know, you'll know that um, story. Um, and and I, I pin this tweet to the top of my sort of timeline, really, because I, when I think about that and, I, you know, think I, I used to think about that with, with uh, as a teacher, you know, about children um, uh, learn, uh, learn when they are loved, you know, and, and, and they because they love what, and then they love what they learn. Um, you know, and and he uh, is classic example of that. You know, uh, all disadvantage and 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 um, you know, growing up in a seemingly fairly uncaring home and um, a bleak future and all that kind of thing in school and but and and written off, you know, as a troublemaker and as a as a you know, not going to achieve anything. And yet, you know, he he found this love of this kestrel and he went to the library and demanded books about falconry and he read them and and he'd never read a book before you know and all that kind of thing because he loved it um and also when someone took interest in him you know that one teacher that did take some interest in what he did and realized gosh he's got such ability there and skill and strength and um you know so he loved he you know if we had children that felt loved and felt supported how much better they would do and and when they love what they're doing as well that they um how much better they do so uh I, not to finish on a negative but you know teaching about fronted ob adverbials doesn't uh, inspire love of learning does it but you know finding out what children love or, or are interested in or would really want to know about that's what brings love of learning i think that's that's the key to a lot of it really as well.